welcome. This, this is actually a talk triggered by uh, the Stockholm group. Because we, we have a Slack channel. And, and this showed up a bit before Christmas. And, and yeah, this is me. Me, 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 me. Please, please. Which processor? Give it to me. It's an old one. Uh, and that costs me a, a talk. <laughs> that's, that's the agreement. Then I get the machine. So, so I just wanted to, to show you what we're, what we're talking about here. It's, it's a powerhouse from 1993. Uh, we're talking, it's still 32 bits, 25 megahertz. That's like three times the performance of your Amiga Atari. Uh, a full 4 megabytes of onboard RAM, upgradable to 8, and so on, with a hard drive. Which, I mean, how many of you did have an hard drive for, for Amigas or Ataris? Or how many of you had an Amiga or Atari back in the days? Did you have an hard drive? No. no. I could afford one to my Amiga 1200 now, but now it's kind of in the past. But I don't have that focus for my games anymore, which is a good thing. Uh, but this kind of led me to, to go, do I want to resurrect an old development environment? And that turns out to be quite painful today. So so what can we do about this? So so I decided that let's let's see how we ended up where we are. But first, I, I just wanted to mention quickly who I am. Um, and, and the really key thing here is not who I am, but I want to secretly promote Post North. That happens in, what is it, three and a half weeks, something. Um, just remember PostNorth.se. It's, it's a four-day conference about free and open source software. So lots of programming content, fully catered. So you basically pay for your lunch and, and you get free seminars. Uh, we have. 30-ish speakers. This doesn't scroll. I wonder if I scrolled the slide deck. Speaking of everything from like, yeah, voice recognition, open source standard, Lisp, Postgres, and so on and so on and so on. Lots of fun. So, if you don't get enough for today, please join that as well. But yeah, the question I ask myself is how did we end up here? Not me wanting an old computer, but C++. Uh, and it all began in a committee in 1958, if you go backwards and then sort of look at the language families. Something called Algol was developed. Uh, and it's an abbreviation for algorithmic language. It had no I.O. standards, it was kind of hard to port stuff. Uh, but what it did have, that was the <coughs> impression cool was Codebox, which is what we're used to in C, C++. And I mean, from, from assembler, most things is an upgrade as long as you can get a reasonable performance. So it was still a step forward, so to speak. Um, there were dialects. So it was, I mean, it's not a language. It's more or less a family of, of languages. But this took us to BCPL uh, by a guy called Martin Richards. Uh, and this one was actually portable, um, and, and, and you can use it to bootstrap new computers and actually move software between computers with, with less pain than before. It was also small, because I mean, we're talking 67. If, if 93 had 8 megs of RAM in, in a really power machine, this, we're talking kilobytes is even, if even that. Uh, but this is the first brace language, so you can do these braces or those that might look more familiar to, to us. Um, and this seems to be, I mean, we have them everywhere, the alternative ones as well, if you look at PHP and so on. Everyone uses braces these days. And, but this is where it all began. Uh, yeah, and I mentioned here that it has one data type, Word. And, and this is kind of interesting, so, something that we don't realize, that, that it wasn't a standard of like a byte, or, or like, the unit of bits that you operate on. So, so for instance, the PDP-8 had 12-bit words, and you address individual words. You couldn't address individual bytes. Uh, and this is not the word that you might run into if you have a disassembler on, on your Amigas and Ataris, where you had byte, byte words, doubles, and so on, representing 8, 16, or 32 bits. Uh, so this is actually the physical word size that the computer addresses. 
which also means that your memory is not 8 bits wide or 32 bits wide, it's 12. So everything is custom made. So when we say portable and standardized, that means that the integer size changes between platforms. So, yeah. But this then leads us to, uh, to some familiar faces, to some of you perhaps. Uh, at least Richie is one of the C guys, but he was also in, involved in developing D. And now it's starting to look kind of familiar. Uh, changes from BCPL colon equals became equals for assignment, uh, and they did a change them for comparison. Still only word, um, but yeah, it's kind of getting there. Which then leads us to 72, the K and RC. Uh, Brian Koenig and, and, and Dennis Ritchie. Uh, who developed this? And I mean, this is this is K and R style C, and, and I think most of you can read it, but it doesn't look like it used to. So, so for instance, you named the arguments here, but you declared them below. Um, it was a develop, developed alongside Unix, and the purpose was really to make programming or programs portable. So, so they wanted that. Uh, it also came along with PDP-11 that could actually address bytes, which meant that you could do data types of, of different lengths and so on. Um, but it didn't have function signatures, since, I mean, you don't know, from, from this one, you don't know the types of arguments. So you can get really interesting errors um, when you work with this. And the funny thing is, I mean, this, this is the schoolbook example, but then Typing is really boring, and I mean, disk space is expensive and all of that, so you don't have to say int. Most things are an integer, so if you don't say anything, we default it. And sometimes return defaults to zero, depending a bit on conventions and, and sort of where you are. So, yeah, you, you can get really interesting errors when you start to slim things down, but this is the same code as the last one. Uh, we just don't declare hard C because it's an int. We don't declare the return, return map of main because it's an int. We don't return anything because it usually defaults to zero. And so on and so on. So it wasn't like W all strict. It's it was very flexible from a programmer standpoint as well. Uh, something that I'd like to to bring up that helped me when I, because I went from assembler to C uh, on the Atari ST and, and how many of you are familiar with the stack, sort of on, on a memory level? So, so you basically put, I mean when you call the main function you put the arguments on the stack um, and then you make a call and you need to know where to go back to so you put the return address onto that stack so you basically increase or decrease the memory pointer as you put things in here, depending on, on your architecture and how the stack grows, in which direction. Then you have some local variables that you create space on space for, again, on the stack. Then you work with all of this. And, and one of the nice things <coughs> with, the, with the C programming model or calling model is that the function itself cleans up its own local stuff, but the caller call cleans up the arguments. So even if you don't have the signature, you don't agree on, on sizes of types and stuff, you end up where you started on the stack. You don't get like an offset error because this one pushes these on and then the function itself cleans them up. So it's still reasonable. You find your way back to the same stack frame at least. It'll still crash miserably, but it's slightly easier to debug. Uh, and my mental model was this. Uh, what, what I declare down here, is what goes onto the stack before the base pointer or the return address, and then whatever I declare down here is just what goes down there. So it mapped my little mental model of how it worked perfectly. So if you understand this, you understand pointers and everything, and how to shoot yourself in the foot properly. Um, but as you notice, there were no return values because this is CPU dependent. How you do it, and it could even be OS dependent. So it's just a convention. So if we look at the C declaration standard for x86, how, how Intel thinks it should be done, anything that fits into EAX, EDX, so these together form 64 bits, should go in there, and we don't use the stack. Um, if you have something floating point, there's a floating point register that you can use in the same way. And 
to avoid using the stack. Uh, but if you're on Linux, you use a floating point stack, uh, which I think maps to register inside the CPU, but you don't do it the same way as you do in, on Windows. Uh, and then if you want to return something, something bigger, you hide that you actually do it via the heap, uh, and you use EX, EDX for, for the pointer to where you put the return, return data. So it's, this one is, is really fun. Uh, I've, I inherited a large code base with lots and lots of warnings. And then you don't see this warning that you have a code path that doesn't return a value. And then whatever happens to be in the register is what you get back. And you can look for that for quite a few days before you realize where you messed up. So never, ever, ever ignore warnings. That's my big takeaway from that. There are other fun aspects when you look at the old computers and, and what you do around this. So you usually don't have a memory management unit, so you don't have a like a local address-based processor. So if you write to the wrong address, you can write to another processor's memory space. So you can crash other programs and so on. Uh, but this means that you can't really relocate stuff either, which is very interesting. So, so if I just looked for what I can find. Gemdos, the, the Atari operating system, defines <coughs> the following segments in, in the entry point, and one of them is a relocation table, and that's basically addresses in the binary that needs to be changed, depending on where you loaded the file. You actually have to modify the, the compiled program in memory in order to be able to load multiple programs, or to load libraries, wherever you want them, and so on. Which means that debugging is kind of tricky, because it's not as if you keep a simple table somewhere, you, you patch the binary to, to where it happens to be. So the addresses don't add up when, when you try to debug it later on. Um, and this was very common, I mean you need to do it, there is no other way to, to make relocatable code. So isn't, isn't the, the link command on Linux called LD? Yes. So it stands for loader. So from the days when you did the relocation, when you loaded the program into memory. Yeah, now I think it's the LDD that does the dynamic link. Thing. Yeah. No, the prints it out. Ah, okay, yeah. But yes, you still do the same thing. It's just that yes. you do it in a local address space at least. So mm -hmm. it's slightly easier. But yeah, the program problem is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. But that's why it's called LD. Because it's because it was yeah. done at load time. Yeah. And then I just wanted to show this very quickly. I mean, what, what are we talking about? Where, where, where do you encounter these things and, and also kind of go on a rich, style C programs and so on? And I started with C when I got my hands on Lattice C. I don't know if it was, if it was version 5. It was something I was given from a, from a working buddy from my dad when he chucked it out. It uh, does. Pardon? It is DOS or this window? Or no, no it's actually GEMDOS. Ah, so yeah. it's, it, it's even older. Ah. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, this is an Atari <laughs> STFM, I think. So it can both drive a monitor and has a floppy. But I had the E model enhanced, so it had more colors. <laughs> uh, and it came with 1 mega RAM, which was double the RAM of my friend's Amiga 500, so I was super proud. And the clock was 8 megahertz instead of 7 point something, so it was way faster. <laughs> he could do hardware for sprites, but never mind the details. Uh, and after a while, my dad actually got us 4 megs of RAM, so it was amazing. You, you could load, like, what is it, 5 floppies into RAM at the same time. Um, and then you try to run a C compiler on this. Um, and as I recall it, and I haven't really been able to find it right now. So if you want to do a graphical program with like the Windows system and all of that, you have one project disk and six disks with tooling and libraries. So each build included seven floppies that you go forth and back between. So yeah, it takes a while and you never ever forget to brace or a semicolon. You get really good at reading your code. And I mean, this doesn't have syntax highlighting or like flashing the, the parentheses and so on. You sit and count them. Because otherwise you've lost 15 minutes of compilation time. 
it's it's still far better than than the really early like Fortran styles where you did the paper cards and have to turn them into jerk and wait for two days and then you got your error message. So it's an improvement, but it, it's still you learn to read your code properly before you send it to the compiler. So then I want to talk a bit about what I call oddware, uh, which is fun. Because, I mean, we have really small computers, and, and we tried to do something fancy. I mean, C was written for Unix. I mean, those came in refrigerator box-sized boxes, and you tried to do it on a home computer. So memory is really tight. Floating point was something you did in software, which uses memory, so let's not have that. And at the same time, we, we can take almost anything, because it keeps us from writing assembler. So there was quite a lot of wacky stuff going on. Um, I saw that this one came in 95, and I still have this floppy, the Highsoft C interpreter. That's how I learned how to program the, the windowing system, because then you could experiment without having all these floppies. But this is a C interpreter uh, with pointers, without memory protection, so you can incidentally poke at exactly anything, <coughs> including your tools. Um, and yeah, the best way to learn is to make mistakes, and I've rebooted the computer so many times because, I mean, there is no memory protection, there is no multitasking. If it crashes, it crashes properly. There's no way to get your data back. Uh, but this is, I mean, it's such a crazy idea. Uh, I really like it that you interpret. It's like peeking and poking a basic, but even worse. Uh, and then there are lots of like derivatives of C. So there's one called small c that is still active today. Uh, and, and what they say is we, we don't want structure unions or, or more than one dimensional arrays. Floating point we can use for yet on these processes anyway. Uh, and they also drop the information of like the need for typecasting or, or size of. And you can only return int because of you don't want to do heap allocation and stuff for, for larger structures. You just, it's int and it's one register. Um, and this works on a number of, of micro computers around. Uh, so the 6502, 6510 is one for, for the C64 family. Uh, something for Atari 8 bits um, and the Z8 based ones like Spectrum and all of those. But really small 8 bit computers. And you can still get a subset of C, so you can lift the abstraction. You can write one plus one instead of moving one into a register and add it to another register and move it back. And so on. You smile. You remember the 68 HC11 classes of Chalmers <laughs> in that. <laughs> um, then I looked around, and I mean, there are lots of these around, and most of them aren't dead. Uh, there's something called BDSC which is popular for CPM, which is like the predecessor to DOS. It looks a lot like DOS, but DOS is a rip-off of CDM, CPM. I don't know when CPM started, mid-70s, I guess. Uh, and they target the Z80 and Intel in 16-bit mode. Uh, TinyC, which I've actually hacked, it's almost, they say it's moving towards ISO C99 standard. So it's almost there. Uh, but it's tiny, which is cool when you do... Well, I did electrical engineering and wanted to learn about compilers, so I couldn't take the compiler courses. Uh, but this has a preprocessor compiler assembler and linker that goes in 100 kilobytes. Uh, and also when you were younger and booted Linux from a floppy drive, you can actually put your tuning onto that floppy drive and build something without ruining your parents' hard drive. Because mommy really wants her Windows 95. <laughs> <laughs> um, LCC is something I've used and something that's still around. Um, little C compiler, I used it for building DLL files uh, back in the days when I couldn't afford Visual Studio. There is a derivative from this called Pellis C, and that guy has to be Swedish because it's called smurgosbordet.com. I don't know who it is, but it's, and I haven't had time to look at it, but it's, it has to be a Swedish thing. Uh, there's the PCC, the portable C compiler. I know that some Amiga tooling is based on it, but I haven't, I wasn't able to, to figure out which one it was, but I've seen this binary around 
on on Amiga. Uh, but this is a really old one. It was written at Bell Labs mid '70s. I mean, it's an early C compiler uh, built in parallel to Kernig and Ritchie, so it has pedigree. Um, and something that seems really active today that I haven't used myself is this small device C compiler, which actually supports lots of microcontrollers like the, the small Atmos and Pix and so on. Uh, so the, there are a lot of families of compilers that we don't generally use that are still alive and, and thriving and being developed today, which makes me happy. Uh, but yeah, I said ancient C++. And we've gone to C now. Uh, I have to check here because I think we've gone really fast to C. So, I mean, C++ is a messed up language. And, and you start with two Norwegians and then you add a Dane. <laughs> That's how you end up where we are. Um, only one dog and, and Christian Nygård. Uh, invented Simula, which was OOP the way that C++ does it. Um, so they introduced all these concepts, object classes, inheritance, and subclasses, and, and all of this, virtual procedures, so basically the V-table calls. Um, but they also had garbage collection and more stuff. And, and this is just a Simula program taken from Wikipedia to show you how it looks. To me, it looks a lot like, like Pascal, more Pascal than, than C. Uh, but still, I, I think we can sort of figure it out that we have a class, <coughs> glyph, we can inherit the glyph and create a character, we can inherit it and create a line, and then when we actually work over here, we don't have to care which type of glyph it is, so we have polymorphism and so on. So, so the basics are there. Do you make the distinctions between Simula and Simula 67? Yeah. I don't know. Because I think that is Simula 67. It could be. Is because Simula was a discrete event si um, simulation language that didn't have classes. Okay. And Simula 67, which came in 67, added classes. That's a good point. So that's Simula 67. It says me. Yeah, I'm not programmed in Simula 67. <laughs> <laughs> also. Um, but no, but really, you, but you're you probably right. I, yeah. I can I can double check, and I will share the slides and, and down on all the pages you have the reference there. So I, I will double check check this. Definitely. I would say that the primary, uh, I think, similar sixty seven is a subset of Algol sixty, not Pascal, but Algol sixty. Yeah. No, I I just say that mm -hmm. from a, what it looks like, it feels yes. like Pascal. But I guess. All of this is the same language family. Yeah. One thing that always blows <coughs> my mind is when you look back at old ideas, everything's already been done like 70 years ago. AI and like all the things that are hip today, <laughs> the hip kids did mm -hmm. when we yes, weren't even born. Yeah. You saw the clock in Post North? That's lit, lisp like it's 1959, I think it was called. Still, I was also thinking one thing. Every language, whatever the language came in the market now or the previous language, it, it will convert into the assembly language at last and then it will convert into the binary, right? If you talk about the low level, that's how it comes. Yeah, I mean, every, everything is compiled into... I mean, it will be give you the assembly language, right? Once it will compile and execute, then yes. it will convert to the binary. So, so everything is an abstraction on top of... The, the assembly language. And I mean, yeah. when, when you look at, and this is actually then the next slide, that C was called C with classes. So originally it was mm. something that was compiled to C before it was compiled to, to machine code or assembly. Uh, so it was a language on a language. Um, yeah, he started in 79, C with classes. Uh, and in 85, the standard or, or the book was published. So there was something to, to touch on. Um, then it was updated or standardized in 89, and things went really, really, really slowly uh, until 2011. And now we have this three-year cycle where we're especially, I mean, to me it feels as if you're developing the meta stuff so that you later on can develop the language in the header files. 
so the compiler becomes sort of a smaller, it, you don't have to update the compiler every day. There you can focus on like CPU optimizations. So it's moving in a direction to, to make it even quicker to change and experiment with the language. There is something that came out in parallel called Objective-C. Uh, it was popularized by, by Next Computers and picked up by Apple. Uh, and I mean, it, this was one of my assumptions uh, before using it to write a simple Hello World app and never touch it again. Uh, <laughs> it is not C++, it's a crazy syntax. And, and when you start digging into this, that it be, it's because it does not come from Simulan and that school of OO. It comes from Smalltalk, which is super fun because then you go back to Xerox Park and the mention of the GUI and the digital office and everything that's cool today back in the 60s <laughs> with a completely different budget, of course. Uh, so the school here is really that you, you make decisions runtime. Um, you have so much more metadata and everything's done at runtime, the polymorphisms and everything. It's, it's not, it is compiled, but it's, I would say you haven't done all the linking when you run it. You make a lot more decisions while running. Uh, this has some benefits. So I mean, instead of doing function calls, you send messages between objects. That's the general concept. And that means that you can also message nil because the dispatcher, so to speak, catches that. So you don't have all these null pointer reference issues, at least not when making function calls to objects. You can still shoot yourself in the foot, of course. Uh, but yeah, it's a completely different mod memory model. It's a completely different school of how to do OOP. Uh, there are lots of lists, like where, what are all the differences. The problem is that they also list like the bool. It's called bool in capital characters and not in, in lowercase and so on. So it's, it's hard to filter out the high level stuff. But I say this is the real key. It's, it's completely different theoretical background to, to how to do OO and what an object is. So it looks different. But then coming back to to C++, um, there was a C compiler called CPre that was used to, to it was derived into C front, which was the original um, C++ compiler or transpiler, I think is the correct word, because it compiled from C++ to C, and then you used your local C compiler to compile it into something that you can run. Um, and C front comes from 1983, and it's called C with classes, the first release. The last release was version E, I think, uh, which is from like 93, when they tried to add exception support and couldn't do it. So then, then it ended up. Um, I was an hour early, so I thought I'd let, let's try to build this. That would be fun. Uh, the problem is that Cfront is written in Cfront style C++, which is really old. You can't really build it today. But that was also a problem when you didn't have a C++ compiler. So, so you, you do bootstrapping. Uh, so Cfront comes with a pre-generated set of C files that you can use to build like a Cfront Lite that you then use to build your Cfront proper uh, on your machine. Uh, my problem was that when I ran the first step, which is create this I'll take these pre-generated files and, and do the, the pre-C front compiler. I got a error that I had one hit on Google on, and I don't even know which language this is. <laughs> and I didn't have time to, to Google Translate and really struggle through it. But it, it's not the compiler, actually. It's the, the Bison stuff. I think my, my grammar compiler is too modern, uh, because they expect like a mid-80s EAC from, from proper Unix. So yeah, it, you can download it here. It's kind of fun because the, the original download is a set of PDFs with handwritten notes from Strostrup. And, and then some poor bastard has transcribed this into source files again. So it's, yeah, it's papers printed with source code and someone with a red pen sitting and writing on them. And that's the standard. And then, I ran into this, which is kind of interesting. Vala. Who here uses 
GTK GNOME. Uh, <laughs> Canomish, maybe. <laughs> they, they had this thing going on. I don't have exact dates. I mean, it's still a live project, but my impression is that it's kind of fading out now. Um, but it's a transpiler from, from this Vala that is C-sharp-like, so C++-like, uh, to C. Uh, but instead of transpiling it to, to C code where you used to use name mangling and structs to build the structures, they use this G object model, uh, which I would say is almost simulink like because you keep a lot of introspection data. Um, so it's a C program with lots of, of instrumentation and, and sort of hooks into it uh, because of the object model. But they can do things like reference counting and inheritance and all of that without having to write two screens of boilerplate code, which you do when you write G object code in, in C. Because there you have to do all the C++ syntactic sugar with macros instead and, and conventions. So I had to put this in, in smaller type, but basically it's very close to what Qt produces because what they do is they take C++ and they have a meta object compiler that extracts the metadata. And here they have a Vala compiler that also preserves the metadata. So it's, from that standpoint, both outcomes are kind of similar in what you have at hand when you execute. It's just that it's competing projects and they don't want to be close to each other. <laughs> but it really is. Once I wrote a gtk.h file that was only a set of wrappers around Qt classes and function calls, and I could do the Hello World examples as one from the tutorials. So, I mean, they both are abstraction on X11. They, they do the same thing and everything's called the same thing. It's just that they couldn't agree on camel case or underscores in the function name. But yeah, what, was this the dark ages then? I mean, incompatibility problems, it was hard to compile stuff, you couldn't agree on, on how large a word is. And, and yeah, when I started, I think I started with C++ around 95 or 96 the very first time. Started as a strong word, I touched it the first time. Uh, and I mean, you had this thing that SDLs didn't behave the same way. You could have different complexity in the same call depending on which SDL library. So you had to change your code to be fast. And, and it's always, this is the problem. For the trivial cases, it looks the same, it works the same, but it's not the same. So, so it's, it's as soon as you build something complex that you run into this. Um, this is my pet peeve. I, I was in a Windows environment. This VC98 is the name of the binary, and I hated it with a passion. It sucks at templates, and I really wanted to do templates. And it, it sucks at runtime type information. So if you compile two DLLs from the same sources and compared pointers and, and wanted to type cast using these dynamic casting functions, it was different types because it was in different binaries. Uh, and, and loads of stuff like that. So that's what drove me to Qt actually, because if you look at the details of Qt, they solve a lot of these problems because that's the problem to move code back in these days. And then you had all the compiler-specific extensions, and you also had CPU-specific extensions. This is a C memory to me. I don't know if you've... Has anyone programmed an x86 in 16-bit mode? Yes. Yes. They have something called segments and offsets. They are both 16-bit, so it looks like 32-bit. But the memory bus is 20-bit wide, so they, put, they OR them together. Yes. Which means that if you have different segments and different offsets, you can still hit the same address. And then you have no memory protection and all of that, and trying to debug the shit. It's yes. And yeah, that was yeah painful memories. But I got pixels on the screen super fast, so I could do 3D renderings. And then Photo FX came and everything was void. But yeah, it was fun. Yes. But I still think this is the fun ages, to, to some extent. I mean, the... You have a shitload of options. It's a different CPU in every every machine you get, basically. Um, and you you had the alphas. I have an alpha in a wardrobe in my my garage that I haven't booted. Uh, but that's well, I guess it's my retirement plan these days. I'm missing one of those plastic trays to put the CD in to get it into the drive <laughs> to get it to boot, or a SCSI CD drive. 
Uh, it's one of the old car machines from Chalmers, if you ever did a lecture there. They sold them at the, the ETA auction and I had to get one. Uh, you had more languages. Uh, I mean, this is just the top of the iceberg, but I mean, Pascal was really big. And, and BASIC was still something socially acceptable. It, it wasn't how you did fancy Excel spreadsheets. My first paid job was actually mis mixing Visual BASIC and Fortran, which is, yeah. We had a single processing library in Fortran that sucked to use, so I did a Visual BASIC front end to it. Uh, you also had a lot of more compilers that sort of came and went, and everyone had their own strengths. Uh, Whatcom was super cool because you could do 32-bit DOS programs. So, so when you look, I think it's Doom. It, it has like a little intro text from Whatcom that it switches this over into 32-bit protected mode. Um, and you could backstep the debugger. Backstep. Yes. In, uh -huh, so you can reverse yeah, history. So, yes. So if you, <laughs> yes, so if you, you, you debug your program and you hit an error, yep. so you, instead of stepping forward, you can step backward. Cool. I think that was an incredibly cool yeah. idea. <laughs> I can see so many good use cases for <laughs> <Yes>. that. <laughs> but that was a Whatcom feature then. Yes. Yes. But yeah, then it was a richer ecosystem. I mean, you had all the operating system. You, DOS and Amiga, TOS and, and Mac OS, and then you had proper Unix, and you could do Linux when you wanted to try the flavor and so on. And, and what I also liked was that at the same time, for almost everything, you didn't have memory protections, you didn't have to have drivers. BIOS was the driver. Uh, there was no multitasking. So, so it was a lot simpler as well, even if you had to do things yourself. So when you draw to the screen on, on a PC in VGA, you just use a pointer and, and change that memory address and the pixel appears. And the really interesting trick is the screen is 320 pixels wide and 200 high and one byte per pixel. And, and the trick that I was taught, and I mean, there was pre-Google, you couldn't look at it, was to not mul multiply by 320, but you shifted. So you had 256 and then 64 and you added them together and you saved like two, three cycles per pixel. It was amazing. Yes. You felt so smart. Uh, yeah, and you could count cycles because there was no multitasking. There were, there were caches, but they were so small, so, so you could really like look up the table, this is how many cycles an instruction takes, and, and compare. So multiply, take this many, two shifts and an add takes this many, so this is quicker. So a lot less complexity as well. And also, assembler in these days was actually made to be written. Modern assembly is made to do compilers, so it's you don't want to write assembler on a modern CPU because it, it sucks. Um, we talked about different compilers. I talked about the Mac and I wanted to get the compiler going and I failed miserably. <laughs> but I, I had a look at this Think C. I bumped into it and then it caught my eye because it's, it's not C++ but it has object extensions. Trademark Think Incorporated. Uh, so it was developed for Mac development by a company called Think Technologies, <laughs> which was acquired by Symantec and so on, so it kept on living for a while. Um, in '86, it was released as Lightspeed C, and then it was renamed to, to Think C later on. Um, and from version 3, it had OO. So it was a dialect of C or an alternative syntax for it. They also had a class library which made Mac OS convenient uh, called TCL, but we won't touch that much on that. But I found it interesting to, to look at a review of Think C4. So, number one, they, they invert the logic here. So, there's a bullet list saying that these features we don't have. Uh, operating overloading, construction and destruction methods that are uh, automatic, you have to explicitly call them, you can't just create an object and expect the, the constructor to be called. Uh, it doesn't care about public-private. You can put things in object, but everything's, everything's public. You can't do friend functions then, obviously, because everyone's a friend of everyone. Uh, it doesn't do virtual functions. It doesn't do inline code. Uh, 
it doesn't do the double slash comments, uh, and it doesn't do multiple inheritance. Because this is C++ version 2, which I don't know what that means, but they don't. I mean, it's, it's single inheritance, but it still knows what an object is and so on. And this is, I mean, mid-80s to early 90s, so it was still used in parallel to C++. And I, I found it interesting to, to sort of look at how they pitched it. So first of all, they, they do structs, and you don't write public here. That's the big difference in, in how you declare stuff, but otherwise it's the same as C++. And it's the same behavior, because if you do this in C++, all of this is public, because public is default. Uh, and then comes the sales line. You don't have to type def or struct class name to class name. Amazing. Uh, but then it kind of looks like C++. So they have the same syntax with, uh, with the colon colon for, for name resolution, and, and we still call with uh, the arrow, and, and so on. Uh, but when we look at the keywords, they say they don't have keywords so that you, you don't mess up your old legacy code. They don't preserve any additional keywords in, outside of, of the, the C standard. And yeah, new is a function. Which I guess it is in your standard library as well. It's just that you have a keyword that sort of triggers the call to the memory allocator, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then they do lots of fancy casting here. Um, so you have your C application, um, but you create an instance of your app, which I guess is derived from that one. So then they do an explicit cast to, uh, to call something on your app interface. Uh, and then they call run an exit on, on the base class. So it's kind of C++, but not. So this is, I mean, incompatible SDL libraries. You also have incompatible dialects in parallel for different platforms, and they were provided then to, to each vendor. But where are we then today? I would say that we have fewer compilers. And there were lots of small compilers around that, that still live, but they it's for microcontrollers and so on. So it's it's kind of boring. You, you have the three big ones, and it, it seems like Clang or Clang is, is is really taking over. It's approaching monoculture from that perspective. Um, the language is more and more standardized, which is a good thing. We can move our stuff, but you still have the compiler extensions. There's still a huge pro uh, project to compile the Linux kernel using Clang, for instance, because GCC has extensions. And, but this is one of my key takeaways, that C++ is coming back. Because apparently it, it wasn't only about developer convenience. And I'm, I'm not saying that C++ is super inconvenient, but I mean it's still important with performance. You start to, you see it coming back in financial technology when you want short type latencies in read type systems, in industrial applications, and, and if you stick to the modern standards and don't look it's like JavaScript, if you write old school code, it will, you will have all the problems there. But if you stick to newer paradigms, it's modern language. And, and then you get the performance, uh, which was why it was there. That's why C was so basic, because you still wanted the performance. I mean, if you only have 64K of RAM, you can't afford having lots of like virtual machines and stuff. Uh, so it's a compiled language, it's fast, and it's coming back but to slightly fewer compilers, which I think is boring. I think that's the big takeaway. That was a quick tour. <laughs>